Maybe you've heard already that matrices can be decomposed into the products of other matrices. This is called matrix factorization. But maybe you don't know why such decompositions are extremely useful in physics and engineering. Matrix decompositions find applications in many scientific areas. They are for example useful when solving linear systems of equations. However, in this video we will not talk about such theoretical applications of matrix decompositions. Instead, I want to show you a very practical application of matrix decompositions which can be visualized. I want to show you how these decompositions are used for better understanding the mathematics behind deformation. In a previous video I explained how the deformation of objects can be described mathematically. If you haven't seen that video, here is a short summary. We have introduced the deformation mapping phi. Phi is a function that takes a point in the undeformed object capital X and the time t as input and returns the deformed point lowercase x. Afterwards we have studied the deformation gradient f. If we consider an infinitely small volume element at a specific point, the deformation gradient tells us how this infinitesimal element is deforming over time. To be more precise, the deformation gradient gives us the deformed line elements d lowercase x when multiplied with the undeformed line elements d capital X. We can also visualize this in 3D. But note that in this video we will mainly use illustrations in 2D, although the equations are formulated in the general 3D setting. What's nice about the deformation gradient is that it is essentially a 3x3 matrix. This means we can use concepts from linear algebra to better understand how f transforms the line elements. And because all of this can be visualized clearly, it helps us build an intuitive understanding of these linear algebra concepts. For example, we have learned that the determinant of f, often denoted by j, has a surprisingly meaningful physical interpretation. The determinant tells us how much a small volume element in the undeformed configuration changes in volume upon deformation. In this video we will discuss other concepts from linear algebra, matrix decompositions. Specifically we will have a look at the so-called volumetric deviatoric decomposition and the polar decomposition, which are both very relevant from a practical perspective. Let's start with the volumetric deviatoric decomposition, which is also known as the Flory decomposition. The deformation gradient tells us how matter is changing in volume and how it is changing in shape. So we can ask the following question. How much of the deformation gradient contributes to a change in volume and how much to a change in shape? The volumetric deviatoric decomposition answers this question. Specifically, the deformation gradient f can be decomposed into two matrices, the so-called volumetric contribution fvol and the so-called deviatoric contribution fdef. fvol is a diagonal matrix that has the cube root of the determinant of f as the diagonal entries, and fdef is f divided by the cube root of the determinant of f. If you work out the matrix matrix multiplication, you will find that f vol times f def is indeed equal to f. So we have successfully decomposed f into two other matrices. But what have we gained from this? Let's take a look at both matrices individually. The first matrix is a diagonal matrix with equal diagonal entries. When we multiply such a matrix with undeformed line elements, we notice that all line elements elongate by the same factor, and they do not change in direction. This means that the deformation is shape-preserving. Such deformations are called volumetric or dilatational. The determinant of fvol is equal to j, meaning that it contains the entire information about the volume change. The second matrix, on the other hand, has the important property that its determinant is 1. This means that the deformation resulting from this matrix is volume preserving. Such deformations are called deviatoric, distortional or isochoric. This means that we have decomposed f into one matrix that describes changes in volume and another one that describes changes in shape. Let's visualize this with an example. Here is a deformation gradient and the corresponding volumetric and deviatoric contributions. Note that in this video we will consider the deformation gradient at a specific point at a specific moment in time 
such that f doesn't depend on x and t. Let's visualize what the individual contributions are meaning. Here you can see some undeformed line elements d capital X. I also illustrate a circle around the arrow tips. You can think of this as an infinitely small sphere, but note that in this 2D visualization you can just see a cross section of the sphere. If we multiply the deviatoric part of f with the undeformed line elements, the line elements are deforming and the small sphere is changing in shape. However, because the determinant of the deviatoric part is 1, the small sphere is not changing in volume. I admit that it looks like the volume is changing, but that's only because there's also some out-of-plane deformation that we can't see in this two-dimensional illustration. After multiplying the deviatoric part of f with the line elements, we multiply the volumetric part of f with the result. We observe that the volume changes while the shape remains unchanged. Finally, we can see that f multiplied with the undeformed line elements yields the same result as multiplying first the deviatoric and then the volumetric part. We can also visualize this in 3D. Here you can see an infinitely small sphere. The deviatoric part of f changes the shape of the sphere without changing its volume. And the volumetric part of f changes the volume without changing the shape. And again, by multiplying first the deviatoric and then the volumetric part of f, we obtain the same result as directly multiplying f with the undeformed line elements. Decompositions like this are extremely useful, because it helps us to interpret the deformation gradient. In continuum mechanics, the volumetric deviatoric decomposition is indispensable, because meta typically shows a higher resistance to a change in volume than to a change in shape. Using the decomposition, we can separate volumetric and deviatoric contributions of the deformation gradient, and we can control how much they should affect the stresses in the matter. In the extreme case of incompressible matter, like for example water, we have to make sure that the volumetric part is equal to the identity, such that only the deviatoric part is remaining. All of this is facilitated by the volumetric deviatoric decomposition. Before we move on with the next decomposition, note that the volumetric deviatoric decomposition has the special property that it doesn't matter in which order we apply the volumetric and deviatoric transformations. We can also apply the volumetric transformation first, followed by the deviatoric transformation. But it's important to notice that this is only possible because the volumetric part of f is a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. In general, matrix-matrix multiplications are not commutative. Let's continue with another matrix decomposition, the polar decomposition. I believe that this one is even more important when describing deformation, because the polar decomposition reveals that the deformation gradient is actually not a pure measure of deformation. You will see in a bit what I mean by that. The deformation gradient can be decomposed into a matrix R and a matrix U where R is a proper orthogonal rotation matrix, with R transpose R being the identity, and U is a symmetric matrix. In this video, we will not talk in detail about the mathematics behind the polar decomposition. And we will not talk about how R and U can be computed for a given F. All you need to know is that for a given matrix F, there's only one possibility to compute R and U, so that the given properties are fulfilled. If you are interested in details, please leave a comment. Here I just want to draw your attention to the geometric and physical meaning of the polar decomposition. And this is best explained with an example. Here is an example of F decomposed into R and U. Let's see what these matrices do with the infinitesimal element. If we multiply the matrix U with the undeformed line elements, the line elements are deforming. Afterwards, we multiply the matrix R with the result and we observe that the line elements are rotating. With the polar decomposition, we have decomposed the deformation gradient into two matrices. The matrix R contains information about rotation and the matrix U contains information about deformation. If we directly multiply F with the undeformed line elements, we get the same result as first multiplying the deformation matrix U and then the rotation matrix R. Here's another example of the polar decomposition. U deforms the infinitesimal element and R rotates the element. The deformation gradient is composed of both R and U, 
This means that the deformation gradient encodes information about both rotation and deformation. This is a critical observation that might not be immediately obvious, and it has important implications. In continuum mechanics, we want to study how objects deform upon external influences. To this end, we have to formulate a relationship between the deformation and the stresses acting inside the matter. We will not talk in detail about stresses in this video, but maybe you can imagine that stresses should not depend on rotations. If we rotate an object, the stresses inside this object should not change. We also say that stresses should be invariant to rotations. This means that when we want to formulate a relationship between stress and deformation, we should not make our stress depend on f. Instead, it makes much more sense to make the stress depend on u. In contrast to f, u is a pure measure of deformation that doesn't contain information about rotation. We say that u is invariant to rotations. So by making the stress dependent on u, we can make sure that the stress does not change upon rotation. We can see now why the polar decomposition is so useful. It reveals that the deformation gradient contains information about both rotation and deformation. With the polar decomposition, we can separate the rotation from the deformation, giving us R a pure measure of rotation and U a pure measure of deformation. Please note that in contrast to the volumetric deviatoric decomposition, the order of the matrices in the polar decomposition matters. In general, R times U is not equal to U times R. So we cannot simply switch the order of R and U. However, we can use another decomposition to decompose F into V and R, where V is a pure measure of deformation and R is again the rotation matrix. We call this decomposition the left polar decomposition to distinguish it from the previous so-called right polar decomposition. The difference between these polar decompositions is the order in which the deformation and the rotation are applied. In the left polar decomposition, we first apply the rotation and then the deformation. Here's an example of the left polar decomposition. Let's recap. We can use the volumetric deviatoric decomposition to decompose the deformation gradient into a volume changing and the shape changing contribution. And we can use the polar decomposition to decompose the deformation gradient into its rotating and deforming contributions. Both decompositions increase our geometric and physical understanding of the deformation gradient. What's nice about the decompositions is that they can be combined. We can first apply the polar decomposition and then we can use the volumetric deviatoric decomposition to decompose U into its volumetric and deviatoric parts. This means we can now decompose F into three matrices. UDEF describes a pure shape change without any rotations, UVOL describes a pure volume change without any rotations, and finally R describes a pure rotation. This decomposition of the deformation gradient helps us to better understand the deformation gradient and unravels its effect on the infinitesimal element. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching and stay tuned. Bye!